All right, we are pleased to have you with us for public health policy making part one, defining the issue and identifying and defining the issue is a key step to planning everything that follows, uh, what additional data is needed, potential solutions, uh, what the public and decision makers need to know, and, and so much more. So it's only fitting that this is the first webinar of the five that make up the community health through policy change series. So hi everyone, I'm Renee Parks. I'm a research project manager with the Prevention Research Center at Washington University in St. Louis. I will be your host um, for today's workshop and webinar, as well as a co-presenter. This workshop and the series I mentioned just moments ago is part of a multi-year project funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with the overall goal to develop and share strategies to increase the use of effective policies to reduce community health disparities. Our center has the privilege of collaborating with several community health coalitions. Many of you are members of them. So we've been learning about your communities, um, the, your network. So the organizations and agencies that make up um, your health network working on these issues. Um, so learning about those connections as well as your health goals and priorities. All of this with the intent of providing some helpful support or technical assistance for advancing your efforts and improving community health through effective evidence-based policy action. There's a couple things I want to note um, before we move forward. Um, first, this webinar is being recorded. The recording slides and resources will be available after the workshop within like a resource web page, and you'll be provided with the link to that. This is a webinar. So you'll notice um, that you and all of the other attendees are muted and we can't see you, you're not on video, so don't worry. But with that said, um, we'd still very much like to engage with you. We wanna get your input and perspective throughout and um, you can do this. You can um, be active in the chat um, and certainly put questions in um, the Q&A box um, as they come up and we'll get to them as we can. Um, or towards the end of the, the workshop. All right, so there is a team of us making today's webinar possible. I'd like to call in Masume Fagankani, um, who is a co-host and will be monitoring the Q&A and chat. Hello, I'm Masume. It's my pleasure that I'm here today with you all. I'll monitor the Q&A and chat throughout the webinar. You can see chat icon and Q&A icon there at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to drop any questions, comments, and feedback there. Please um, look at this and check this. And you can also post your comment to each other's question as well via Q&A. Uh, feel free to use that. Anyway, do not hesitate to use chat and Q&A to express yourself. I'm here to catch all of them and not to leave any without the answer. Thank you for your participation in advance. I'll return it to Rene. Thanks, Masume. And Masume was also instrumental in pulling together many of the resource materials and the data um, in the activity that we'll do later in the workshop. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Ross Brownson. Dr. Brownson is the Lipstein Distinguished Professor of Public Health at Washington University in St. Louis. He studies the translation of evidence to public health practice and policy with a content focus on environmental and policy determinants of chronic diseases. Dr. Brownson has been noted as one of the most productive uh, public health scholars. I can attest to that. <laughs> Um, he is a former board member of the American Cancer Society and a former president of the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. He is also active in the American College of Epidemiology, where he is a past president. And then prior to joining academia, um, Ross was a division director with the Missouri Department of Health. So Ross, we're pleased to have you with us and presenting today's content. And then um, I am presenting a portion of today's content too. Uh, so I'll just share a tiny bit about me. So prior to my role with the PRC, which I've been in this role for um, seven years now, I spent 15 years conducting and supporting community health in various settings within corporations, um, in community-based organizations, uh, at a couple of college campuses. Um, and I've led 
and been part of multi-sectoral community coalitions, um, advancing different health topics, um, alcohol, tobacco, and other substance um, control, and um, chronic disease prevention at a population level. So that's just a little bit about me and my background. All right, here's our learning objectives for the workshop. So we want you to leave the session with greater familiarity with resources for local data and um, types, understanding types of data. We want you to be able to define criteria for the components of a sound, concise issue statement, and even begin to develop a statement of the issue. This workshop, as well as the next one, is grounded in evidence-based public health, or EBPH, the framework. Uh, and this was actually developed by Ross and colleagues. Um, and uh, the lovely colorful wheel um, covers many different aspects. Um, EBPH really involves engaging the community in assessment and decision-making, applying planning and quality improvement frameworks, adapting and implementing evidence-based interventions for specific populations or settings, conducting sound evaluation, and disseminating evaluation findings to improve policies and programs. So specifically, today's webinar content is really coming from um, the red, assess the community, the orange, quantify the issue, and the yellow, develop an issue statement. These are aspects that really have informed today's workshop. All right. The workshop is also grounded in the CDC's policy process framework, specifically the policy analytical framework, which includes um, three domains, actually five, but the three that I really want to focus um, and draw attention to is problem or issue identification, policy analysis, and strategy and policy development. As you can see in the center, there's um, stakeholder engagement and education central to this work. Um, as well as evaluation. But really, this is beginning with issue identification, which involves determining root causes of pu the public health problem and writing an issue statement. All right, so before we jump into the components of an issue statement, let's lay the foundation with some definitions. Um, and we're gonna start with policy. And before I provide that definition. I want to hear from you all. So when you hear the term policy, what comes to mind? Go ahead and drop those ideas, those thoughts in the chat. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Standards. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jessica. Don't be shy, folks. Long-term change. Yes, great. Guidance, great, great. Keep adding those um, those thoughts. Let me go ahead and advance. So policy is referring to law, regulation, procedure, administrative action, incentive, or voluntary practice of governments and other institutions. Um, it's really been like key, a key aspect of public health right from its beginning. And I just wanna highlight some of the like really common public health policies that have just been commonplace, a, a core part of our society. Um, think food safety policies. So food-related illnesses are a concern, and it's been the job of public health officials to formulate policies to ensure that food that is safe for eating is made available. I think injury prevention, so seatbelt laws, laws mandating the use of child safety seats. And then, of course, I think tobacco control. So. Um, which is really where we can learn a lot and apply that to other um, topics of focus with um, our community health uh, priorities. So um, some of these policies include increasing tobacco prices or, or taxes um, and creating tobacco-free areas and communities to really provide that those conditions for community members to be safe from secondhand um, tobacco use. All right, so let's talk types of policies. Um, so there's organizational policies, which establish guidelines for how potential issues and business decisions are managed. They align 
an organization's vision and values with its day-to-day -day operations. And you might think of like employee conduct policies, dress code, attendance policies. Public policies are defined by the government. They consist of laws, ordinances, resolutions, and orders. And then um, the other type that I wanted to point out, regulatory policies or regulations. These are also known as rules. These really help government carry out public policy. Um, it's a law that's created by an administrative agency. Um, regulations differ from legislation in that they're not voted on by legislative pol uh, bodies, excuse me, like Congress or state legislator or county board of supervisor supervisors or even the city council. But these types of policies really fill in the details of legislation. All right, so policy is really an essential tool to address the drivers of health and enable optimal health, health for all. Um, they have the potential to affect decisions and behaviors of entire populations, reaching many people by addressing issues across the community. They focus attention on structural problems or the community conditions, not individuals. Um, policies really create the conditions in which programs, initiatives, and investments can emerge. Policies sustain change over the long term. Strong policy can really survive changes in leadership, funding, political will. And policy, like I mentioned before, it's a really important aspect of public health and um, goes back to public health's roots. Um, thinking about like those early days and like, housing conditions and sanitation and really working closely with policymakers to ensure that. Um, as this figure demonstrates, four of the 10 essential public health services are really around policy, policy development. So being able to communicate effectively to inform and educate people about health, factors that influence it and how to improve it. Um, mobilizing communities and partnerships to improve health. Um, implementing policies, creating them, um, and implementing them and, and plans and laws that impact health, and using legal and regulatory actions designed to improve health um, and protect the, the public's health. So it's really imperative for public, for community health, to engage in policy development. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Ross to talk about health equity. Thanks, Renee. And so even from your job titles, there are some of you where your whole job is around health equity and social determinants of health. I noticed there's we have a social determinant of health coordinator. We have people working in housing. Then we have other people who might be more on the data side who might be looking at data. So they might be looking at disparities, but all of us are connected to this issue of health equity one or the other. And the, the definition of what we're trying to do is simple, you know, giving everyone a fair, fair lot at health. Doing that is not so simple because there's a lot of things historically, there's a lot of challenges in the systems we have in place. And so the, the visual here is, is thinking about, you know, if you give everyone a bicycle and everyone gets the same bicycle, that that may not be helpful for most of the people in our in our visual. That's equality. Equity is giving people the device, whether it's a bicycle or some other version of what's going to move them based on either their ability or their size or, or other characteristics. And that's really what, um, what a lot of this comes down to be in terms of health equity. So in the next slide, um, a lot of you are probably familiar with some version of an ecologic framework, which is, here's one that is a five level ecologic framework. So let's think of something like, like, healthy eating. Um, you might have individual knowledge. You might have uh, socioeconomic issues that challenge your ability to eat a healthy diet or not. You're interpersonal. You might have a family that eats healthy or has access to healthy foods. That might have an impact. At the institutional level, it might be a work site or it might be the school where your kids go to school that might have a healthy menu or, or lack thereof. The community could be all kinds of different things the community infrastructure, the, the social fabric of the community. And really the important part for this webinar is the public policy that influences all of the other levels of an ecologic framework. And so what these ecologic frameworks have showed us is that the most effective public health interventions operate at multiple levels and they have to take policy into account. 
because policy drives everything. And you already did some of the definitions of that earlier. And that's why we're focusing uh, this series of webinars around the policy issues. Okay, next slide. Um, this one has a lot going on. Um, if you think about sort of the public health issues on the right side of this, this is a public health framework that came out of the Bay Area on, on addressing health equity. Um, what we're going to focus on a lot in this, this set of webinars is some of these social issues, institutional issues, and living conditions. You can map those back, especially to the, the institutional, community, and public policy levels in an ecologic framework. And the nice thing about this, it gives you some real examples of things within these different domains and how they connect to partnerships, how they commit to the capacity building that needs to go on with an example of the kind of thing we're doing today. And then how policy is, is the fabric of all of these. Um, and really this one's focused on the local level in the Bay Area and policy being sort of the fundamental driver of all these leading to the shorter term and longer term risk behavior, diseases and long-term morbidity, mortality and quality of life on the right. Um, okay, so next slide. Um, and I won't spend much time on this. This is a classic paper, um, a, actually a book that, that Jeffrey Rhodes wrote out of the UK that looks at both population level uh, approaches on the right. And here we have, uh, if you lowered sodium in all processed food, it's gonna lower risk for cardiovascular disease across the whole population. That's a population approach. On the left side, the graph, if you look at only the right side, and let's take, for example, uh, young black males at high risk of, of hypertension. Um, that would be a specific population group, particularly at risk, where you're just working on that far right-hand tail of a distribution. And public health does both, and policy can influence both. The left side is a health equity or health disparities approach. The right side is a population approach. And we always have to balance the two. And we're trying to trying to level out the disparities at the same time we're improving population health approach. Okay, next slide. And then this one is a is a review that one of our colleagues, Stefan Zuka, led a few years ago. And all this is saying is that um, think about this issue of obesity and and in your in your local community. Most of the advances we get around obesity and chronic disease is probably not going to come from the the health sector alone. And the nice thing about this, this framework is it puts all of these other sectors in the middle in, in a local community. Every one of these would have some policy driver within them. One might be in the educational setting, another might be city planning, another might be workplaces, even faith-based organizations. And so thinking broadly about the drivers of health or lack thereof is really important when we think about prevention, especially at the local level. Next slide. And then I think this is handoff back to back to Renee. Yeah, thanks, Ross. So, um, you know, collaborations and that collective action to improve health and reduce disparities can really be most successful when it begins at the local level. Um, why? Well, like drivers of health can be influenced through decisions about how local programs and services are delivered. Um, Local governments really have control over those programs and services, like from housing to education to transportation and healthcare. Um, and you know, local policy is really grounded in that deep understanding of health needs, community goals, and lived experiences of residents, and and more likely to create that lasting change that comes from responding to, to local priorities. Um, and a lot of times, local level can be labs for policy change. Um, and really provide the case studies and evidence of success, which um, can be helpful for other local jurisdictions, but really set the stage for state and national changes. Um, and local policy change may just be more feasible at the state or, or compared to the state or federal levels. Um, and so I just wanted to share this table. It's um, adapted from one that was created by Jamie Foster, who's a Connecticut state representative. And she also happens to be a research scientist at the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center. So it just kind of covers those local entities and the health related um, areas with which they have authority. And I, I just want to call attention to um, 
understanding that resource allocation is policy. So the recognition of like funding to go towards parks or trails, that's policy. Um, if you weren't clear on that already. All right. And then I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this framework, but I just wanted to introduce it because we will further explore it in up upcoming webinars. Um, but it really provides a nice way to visualize and understand the components of advocacy and how they work together. So that outer ring is the places where policies are made. And then the next ring in is the actions to make change happen. And I just wanna note that identify the problem and obtain evidence is really one of those key actions. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ross. Okay, so if people don't know anything about baseball or St. Louis, you're not gonna know who Yogi Bear is. Yogi Bear is a famous catcher. He grew up here in St. Louis on the Italian section of St. Louis called The Hill. And he's got some great quotes. If you don't know where you, going. If you don't know where you are going, you might wind up somewhere else. And so the part of this is, and he's got a lot of funny quotes like that, part of this is to help us decide where we're going. And not all the pathways of getting there yet, that will come in later sessions in the in this set of webinars, but really helping us think about this issue statement, looking at data. Uh, we'll have some focus on quantitative data today, but it also involves Qualitative data, as, as, as Renee mentioned at the beginning, if you think about sort of a local community assessment. And so Yogi's quote here is, is a good one. And I, I like this quote, partly because it's hard to make sense out of it. He's, he's kind of a confusing, he's got a whole book of quotes. Um, and he, he is a, he's, a, he's a very interesting guy. Um, okay, next slide. And so as we move toward what is really the heart, the, if you think of what Renee and I just talked about as sort of the backdrop, we think of the heart of what we're trying to talk about today. And you think about, you know, working on food access there at the local level in your community, whether it's in southeastern Missouri or Iowa or, or Louisiana, you know, wherever you might be working. Um, these are some of the, the considerations that you would think about when you're trying to hone in on an issue statement. And the reason is, is, is partly with an issue statement, it's getting everyone on the same page. You know, what is, what is happening now? What should be happening? You know, that's kind of where we're going in, in the Yogi Berra quote. Um, who's most effective? Uh, there's always disparities in every issue, but it's also where the disparities are going, what the trend line is, who's most affected by the disparity, and then how big is the disparity? If the disparity is tiny, then it might be not, not be something where you mobilize a lot of health issue. But if it's if it's significant and you have to decide with partners what that what that word significant really means, then it then it takes on a different flavor. Um, what are conditions underlying this, especially um, social determinants of health, other things that might be sort of structural? Um, what happens if we don't do anything about it, um, including economic burden of a lot of the issues that you're working on? And then where we go to find the data on these things. Okay, next slide. And so you ask for, you know, what we do now is we start thinking about some of the questions you might ask, and especially questions that get toward root causes like social determinants of health. You know, those are, as you well know, those are things like housing or transportation or educational opportunities or justice system challenges. Um, if you think about that, that sort of model we showed where you need to have involvement outside of health, how do we get people interested in these issues who don't have a vested interest in health? And what gets them to the table, what sort of keeps them at the table is, is often very important. Um, when we start thinking about this issue, we wanna be as unbiased as we can. We all come to a table you know, in a discussion like this with our own experience, our own lived experience, the work that you've been doing over the years as, as health professionals. And then we wanna frame things as clearly and as succinctly as possible. Okay, next slide. Um, and these issues aren't simple. I always like to think about, you know, if solving all these public health issues were was simple and straightforward, we'd all be doing something else. You know, we wouldn't be working in public health. So. They, they are often structural issues. They often took many 
years, decades, sometimes even centuries to develop the way they are. Um, they change over time. Um, technology changes. You know, you think about a, a new immunization. You think about something like how we used to think of cervical cancer um, as needs for early detection and then smoking as a risk factor. Well, then we discovered the human papillomavirus and discovered that is responsible for 80 or 90 percent of, of cervical cancer cases led to an immunization. So technology changes. And then how we address health, this is a really big one. How do we address health equity, all of these underlying social determinants of health in what we call a siloed health world um, where we have a, an immunization program and a tobacco program and a diabetes program and go on and on about sort of the siloing of health when, when the answers are cross-cutting all these. And then always linking back to ans asking answerable questions. In other words, beginning to think about data and how data could drive these questions. So, so next next slide. So primarily today, we're we're getting you into these first three parts of developing an issue statement, knowing that uh, doing this is an iterative process. It's going to take a lot longer than this, and so we're going to kind of take you through the beginning of thinking about the problem statement, the issue, a little bit of the background on it. That will involve some quantitative data, a little bit of thinking about potential outcomes and some of the issues that might be working on, and then beginning to think about some of the questions you would pose. And so I think in the next slide, we, we've got some Missouri data. So this is data uh, that we pulled down um, in the, so my long ago training is in epidemiology. Epidemiologists like to think of any issue as person, place, and time. So person might be our, uh, women being affected by a health issue more than men, or are a, a certain race and ethnicity affected by a different one, uh, by a health issue differentially? Or does education have an impact on some health issue? A place might be geographic variations or even variations locally within a community, let's say by zip code. And then time is how is data changing over time? And so here's an example. Um, Based on epidemiologic data, about 76% of adults in Missouri participated in any physical activity in the past month. These are data that we would get from the, the state behavioral risk factor surveillance system. And we look at rates of activities are essentially constant over the past five years, but activity is lowest among least educated populations. And so the next slide will show the visual of these data. And this, these are real data from 2011 through 2021 showing rates of physical activity in the past month. And what you see here is a very large gradient. Um, you basically saw the lines overall are very level. So there's not much change over time. But if you look at that personal characteristic, the people with the most education. So if, if you're a college graduate, your rate of activity is much higher than someone with less than a high school education. So this shows us you know, for that purse characteristic, there's a social determinant around education that seems to be underlying this important risk factor related, related to physical activity. Okay, and then next slide. And so the question you would ask, and, and all of you work at some level, some, some way or another at the local level, this issue of secondary data. And all we mean by secondary data is that somebody else has collected the data for you. In other words, you might go to a web portal, you might have a data person on your team, you go to and you say, find me um, my local data here in Poplar Bluff around this risk factor that I'm interested in. And it comes from a variety of sources. It can come from a surveillance system. It can come from an epidemiologic study or some data collection system that's been there. It might come from the literature. Um, here we're talking mostly about quantitative data. Qualitative data are also really important. We'll talk just a little bit about those today, and that'll come in later. You know, quantitative data being the numbers and qualitative data being the words. And both are important when you think about the kinds of information that's, that's useful. And um, some of these are going to be particular to a, health, a specific health issue, like we just showed with physical activity. Others might be the underlying fabric. So, for example, if we have, um, if you have 
uh, walking trails in your local community, you might want to map where they are and what transportation systems are available to allow people to get to those walking trails if they're not all over in different neighborhoods around the, around the city. And you might want to map where are rates of obesity the highest or where are physical activity uh, patterns the lowest in a community to see how those connect up with transportation patterns or where walking trails are available in a local community. And these could come from a whole variety of sources. And we've listed out a few of, of sort of example sources here in this slide. And then the next slide, I think Renee is going to show some other great sources that are out there uh, from a variety of different places. Yeah, so these are some, some nice secondary data, um, data already collected uh, for resources for local data. So either at the county level or even at the city level. County health rankings and roadmaps, city health dashboard, places, local data for better health, and then the Rural Health Information Hub. Um, I'm curious, like, which of these resources are you familiar? And you can just drop in the chat, like, the, the number that the resource corresponds to. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps has been around for a while and really good stuff. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So, some, so there's some familiarity. I am curious, which ones do you use? So drop that in the chat. Which one do you use regularly? Or maybe not regularly, but um, yeah, County Health and Gains and Roadmaps, which is a great, really great resource. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a moment to actually, and it'll be really quick um, because I wanna stay on track with time, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen or, and kind of walk through some of these. So it, it sounds like there's a good deal of familiarity and use um, um, with county health rankings and roadmaps. If you're not familiar with this, um, it's wonderful. Um, quickly, you can explore health rankings um, and, and data on uh, real drivers for health, outcomes and drivers for health. So we can go here to the explore health rankings and there's a, a wealth of information about the measures, the methods, and you can explore that further. But if you wanna find data, so um, we can do it at the state, county or zip code level. I'm just gonna put in Fayette. So Fayette's a, a county in Kentucky. And um, it's this is just really user-friendly. So it pulls up and you can see we're on 2022's um, data or information, but you can select others. Um, and you can see overall the rank for Fayette um, among all of the counties in Kentucky. Um, and just kind of where, where this county falls um, in regards to health outcomes and health factors. Um, then as you scroll down, there's a whole bunch of other information, county demographics, um, and then um, the snapshot, and this provides health outcomes. You can see those outcomes, health factors, so specifically behaviors, um, and so, and, and social and economic factors. And you can kind of scroll down and see those. Um, and you see it for the county and the state, and then overall US. So really good stuff. I'm just going to point out a couple things that I just recently came became aware of. So you can choose like show areas to explore. So maybe they're um, they're on the higher side. Um, so it kind of draws your your eyes, your attention to that. And also show areas of strength. That's really important. So um, really having um, identifying those assets in a community. And then I I will call attention to there's this like trends icon. It um, and so I'll just click on that really quick and it'll show, um, in this case, it's alcohol and air driving deaths in Fayette County um, from 2008 to 2020. And it's uh, for Fayette County. And it also shows um, Kentucky, the overall in the green, and then 
um, in the gold, goldish color, yellow is the US. So some really great resources. Um, you can look at the state overall, the map of Kentucky. Um, and this is uh, looking at the state by health outcomes. We could choose from a myriad of, um, of indicators. Uh, social and economic factors, and it will show and um, the the key or the color coding for the rank. Um, so yeah, this is great. And I also, if you haven't used the feature of like comparing, comparing counties, comparing states, so you can do that. So right now we have Kentucky, we can add a location, we could add um, Allen County, we could add another county, and we can see across. Um, so that's a really nice feature. All right, I'm going to hop over to City Health Dashboard, which is another great resource providing um, data at the city level and at the zip code level. Um, and you can see the map of the U.S. kind of in the background, and the dots are for all of the cities that are part of um, the City Health Dashboard. It's more than 900. Um, again, you can find out more information. Um, coming over here, there's uh, some information about um, this particular dashboard, but you can look at uh, city and put in Lexington. Lexington's actually in Fayette County. Um, oh, it's it's remembering my search. So I was looking at broadband connection um, in, for Lexington, Kentucky. So it shows this nice little bar over here, bar spectrum, and it gives information. So you can see um, the average of the dashboard cities and where Lexington falls um, and understanding that this lighter side of the, the gradient um, indicates better outcomes. We can come over to the map and we can see it. It's a nice visual um, at a glance. We can click on the particular area and see um, what the, the broadband connection um, percentage is, those who have access. Um, we can change the metric. They have a bunch. They overlay nicely with the county health rankings and roadmaps um, outcomes and drivers of health. Um, I will call attention to these tabs at the top really quickly so you can look at the overview um, of all of these or a lot of these factors. Um, you can look at demographics. And then I just want to call attention to this because I think this is another neat feature. You can compare cities. Um, and I actually use this. So filter to find comparison cities. Um, and I think it's neat that they have these different aspects. So we can do it by population, location. So maybe like adjacent states. I want to have a match by race and ethnicity and poverty level. And there's a match with Fort Wayne. So Fort Wayne might be a, a good comparison city. Um, I know there is some familiarity with places, local data for better health. Um, I'll call attention to this really quickly. I'll click on the interactive map. So places, um, do, 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 do. You can see uh, across the very top that they have health outcomes, which are listed across here. Uh, prevention measures, so these right here, and then health risk behaviors listed across here, and health status listed across here. I'm going to go back into health risk behaviors, and I don't know, sometimes it can be a little bit slower. Um, okay, I'm going to put in Lexington again. Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, and this is for binge drinking. Oh, dang. So this is one of the quirks, like, okay, I'm going to click on physical activity, and sometimes I will need to, oh, no, nope, it didn't do it this time. So it stuck with Lexington. I hadn't, I didn't have to search again. So you can see the map. Um, you can click on the different tracks and get information um, about that particular area. So I'm going to scan. And so for this particular tract, uh, let's see, the estimated prevalence of physical inactivity among adults aged 18 years and older is 31%. But it's nice. It's really, you're really able to see um, 
where there's concerns. So that, that place feature is really um, easy to tell. Uh, so yeah, places is a really great tool. And then the last one, I don't think anyone mentioned um, the having familiarity with the rural health information hub. I'm gonna draw attention specifically to um, the Rural Data Explorer, which can be found here under this tab, Rural Data Visualizations. Um, so you can see it has a set of indicators, um, health disparities, health workforce, healthcare access, social determinants. Um, okay. High school diploma. So, um, it has the years down here, and then I'm going to select Missouri. We can zero in on Missouri. Um, so it provides county level, and you can see like Franklin County, Missouri, um, the percentage, and, and so forth. Um, so it's this is a nice resource. There is um, a chart gallery, and you can search by by topic. Um, you can search by, well, the type, which I, I think is interesting, but you can search by state as well. So if I look at Missouri, you can see the different um, charts that are available. So yeah, I just wanted to introduce, let me go back to our presentation, but I, I do hope that you explore um, these further. I think they're really great resources and there's ever-changing features. So if you haven't been in in a while, a um, couple months, pop in and explore. And then um, here are some additional secondary data resources. Um, I'm just gonna call attention to the state, the first bullet point, the state-specific data resources. Um, we will provide this in the resources after the workshop. So um, I think some of you are already accessing and familiar, but we wanted to ensure that you have familiarity with these really great surveillance systems that are available for your specific state. All right. So um, if data doesn't exist or not all of that, the data you want exists in secondary sources, you might have to collect your own. So I um, just want to call attention. There's two kinds of data, quantitative and qualitative. And I know we've been talking about secondary data sources, and this is, you know, quantitative numbers and counts, but just um, to pay heed to other quantitative methods um, that are available and you might be using um, surveys by far is probably the most common, um, online surveys in particular, especially um, online and in person to a degree, but Phone surveys are are really going away. Um, I think with phone, it's really more about like um, short text or SMS surveys that are maybe happening and maybe some of you are utilizing those, but I think more often than not, it's online surveys and, um, you know, thinking about SurveyMonkey as a tool or Qualtrics or even RedCap or, or Google Forms, so. And then if you're not familiar with intercept surveys, um, this is like stopping random people on the street or um, like at the farmer's market. Uh, and I think what's really important with intercept surveys is um, you really wanna be working with your, uh, your community members um, to give credibility and um, just get familiarity, so. And then I, we've talked quite a bit with counts um, but I just want to give a nod to network analysis. Uh, and I know some of you are quite familiar with this. We had the chance to do a network analysis as part of the project to really look at connections between organizations and agencies that are involved with um, your community's health efforts. Um, and it's really instrumental in helping to visualize and describe kind of those, those um, health systems or health networks. So it really provides that nice tool to illustrate to others, but also to really think about and to guide planning um, within the network. Like who's missing? Who else could be engaged? Could they be engaged further? 
Um, so yeah, so while quantitative data is really central to assessment and evaluation, um, we know that assessment and um, describing and defining an issue can really be enriched through the use of qualitative data. So I want to talk a little bit more about qualitative data and methods and, um, you know, go ahead and drop in the chat, like, respond to like, what do we mean by qualitative data? Or like, how do you think of qualitative data um, in adding to an assessment or describing or characterizing an issue? I don't know, hang in there. I know we're, we're sharing a lot of information and we're kind of moving rather quickly. Um, but these are um, the kind of two main buckets of qualitative methods that are most common, observations and interviews and listening. Um, and so, um, you know, as Ross mentioned, these are text-based, they're grounded in participant perspective, and they really can help um, describe the complexity, breadth, or range of occurrences. Um, and I think it's it's best paired with quantitative data to really provide that, that full picture. I'm sure there's, um, you have some familiarity with these. We're going to talk more about observations um, as we move forward. Um, some that you might not be familiar with, think aloud, uh, which I actually got to participate in uh, recently, that's really having like a, a an observer like working with you like for a particular interface and encouraging a person to think out loud as they're moving through that interface. It was kind of a neat process, um, and also considering like unique methods like crowdsourcing um, to really uh, not just for funding, but like for actually getting work and um, generating content from. Um, a swath of people, so. All right, so observation is a really powerful tool. Um, we're not gonna be able to get to the activity um, that we typically do, but just wanted to point out like some things, um, you know, keeping in mind your your level of detail, you know, where will you be doing like a broad like windshield tour to get um, that look of the community or will it be more focused? Will you be doing um, a sidewalk audit, for example, to look at specific characteristics of the sidewalk? Um, will your focus be on people and how they appear to be behaving or will you observe the physical or built environment? Um, will you observe how people are relating to one another? Um, will you be observing demographics? I, like, I'm really leery of this, really beware. This is kind of a very cursory measure of these characteristics, and you're better relying on secondary data for this. Um, and then um, keeping in mind, like, other sensory observations, because I think Sometimes I know that I can even fall into the habit of just focusing on what I can see, but really pull, pulling in and paying attention to um, sounds, smells, touch, those other senses. So really just want to point out that the characteristics you will observe will be driven by the questions you want to answer in the assessment. Um, a couple things to consider observations versus interpretations. So it's really easy to make inaccurate interpretations based on observations and our own experiences and biases can really get in the way. Um, so it, it's really important to have multiple team members observe. Um, that can be really helpful um, and actually provide some reliability. And, you know, we all have biases um, and they can definitely impact our, our data collection. So um, you know, there are resources for examining your biases. We've noted one resource down below, Project Implicit. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, another aspect is, did you tell people you were observing them? So going into a community without prior permission can really create a situation of like resentment, um, especially if you're doing a specific observation, like using, doing an audit. So, um, you know, less of a problem with kind of 
like general or broad observations. So what can you do? Um, really inf inform the community that it's gonna happen. But you don't have to say when. So um, recognizing that going back to, people will go back to their normal behavior um, after a bit of time. And then did you participate? Um, so making a connection with community members can be, can help to make you more accepted um, and get better data. Uh, and then make decisions about the focus of the observation prior to your assessment. And um, as well as the duration of the observation, is this going to be short versus long-term? Um, so this is going to depend on your assessment questions that you are asking. You might have um, a great deal of familiarity and have used photos, videos, and photo voice. This can be incredibly powerful um, at really highlighting um, issues or concerns. And of course, this can be done by staff, volunteers, community members. Um, I really like photo voice. I did have the chance to um, help carry out a photo voice project when I was back in Kansas City doing some work around um, healthy food access and physical activity environments. And it was really powerful, um, really raising um, awareness of like overlooked issues. Um, and so photo voice is really pulling in community members to have them um, take the pictures and share their interpretations. We're not gonna be able to do this. I would love to, but we're not gonna be able to get to um, observing. I, I would love for you guys to uh, observe these playgrounds and, and respond in the chat, um, but I think we'll, we'll skip over these. You can do these on your own, um, but just to talk a little bit about community audits, um, they're really uh, tools to help us standardize our observations. Um, and um, I'm, I'm gonna share some community audits, but we have like, you know, um, there's, there's many different types um, and they can be used for um, like food environment, uh, physical activity environment. Those are the things that come to mind for me. Um, so here are a couple community audit tool examples. So. This um, is the community park audit tool. Um, and then this one is from AARP. Um, one of their tools as part of their walk audit toolkit. So it can be really helpful to ide identify needed changes um, before some sort of intervention and then be able to document changes um, and improvements after. And then Here's one um, on the nutrition environment, and there's more at this website. Um, this one's specific to the farmer's market. And we're actually going to transition to an activity and where you'll have a chance to kind of apply some of the, um, the aspects that we've been talking about thus far. So we have, um, and Masumi is gonna drop in the chat in a moment, links to, um, some slides, some Google slides. So um, within those Google slides, we have provided some data on issues related that are, are, are interconnected. And these are from secondary data sources. Um, some of them you'll, you'll catch on quickly, county health rankings and roadmaps, city dashboard, but also for your state. So these, these data um, are specific to your your region, your community. So you'll want to choose um, the slide link or the link to the slides that correspond to your community. So I want you to review, spend a couple minutes reviewing the data that's been provided. And I want you to, there's a, a slide that is devoted to this um, kind of like sticky notes. They look like sticky notes. It's pretty user-friendly, but I want you to start to, after you review, then take a couple minutes to just like start to describe the issue based on the data that you have. And I know it's limited, um, but just kind of jot down some, some thoughts or ideas. And then I want you to shift gears and think about what other data sources would you want um, that would be helpful? What's missing? What would be nice to know and have? Okay, so I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna give you, um, about 10 minutes to 
to run through these different things and I'll kind of cue you as to when you can, you should probably transition to um, that next portion. So from reviewing data to actually describing the issue. So go ahead and click on um, the link that corresponds to the community in which you work or serve and go ahead and review those, those first initial slides on the data that's been provided. We're still thinking about, you know, summarizing the issue. This is one we put together. This relates to um, prevention of breast cancer, morbidity, mortality, especially excess mortality. You know, knowing that mammography screening will, um, if you get to full population levels of mammography screening in, a, in the right age population, you can reduce breast cancer mortality by up to a third. And so it's a, it's a very big yet still underutilized public health measure. And so this looks at um, the highest risk group, women 50 and older, um, that only basically three quarters are receiving mammography screening every year. Then we get in some of the, the data around time, you know, the time period of five years. Um, we find screening rates different by race and ethnicity. Um, and then we also find screening rates different by income level and by education level, just like we find with many, many different health issues. Um, and we also then look at data from mortality rates from SEER. SEER is, a, is basically a, an epidemiologic database. I won't go into the details of that. Um, the, the very, the very uh, challenging issue with this sort of an issue is when you look at screening rates, they're higher among Black women, which you would think would lower mortality rates, but when you look at mortality rates, they're much higher. So it also lets you look at sort of a disconnect in the whole continuum of prevention, early detection, and then treatment. Because what's what's probably happening here, while Black women are getting access to screening, they're not getting access to er the, the early treatment, the state-of-the-art treatment for breast cancer. And so um, what's likely happening is breast cancer is being treated at at later stages and is also not getting optimal treatment. So there's a lot of issues at play in a statement like this. And if you're working on an issue like this, um, there are lots of pieces you could think about. How do we target services better? There's a gap for every group of women, but then there's particular gaps when we move from early detection to prevention to, to treatment. And so that's sort of the complexity of this. And this is a good example of how you would take the data like we just showed you and build it out. Um, and, the, and the tools we showed you are just examples. And, and what we're hoping from this is it gets you thinking about some of these data sources and then taking a little bit more systematic approach to writing out a problem state. Okay, so next slide. Um, remember we had three primary parts we were gonna talk about today. The, the statement of the issue, which is the main part we're talking about, and then some of the outcomes, and here's some outcomes of relevance to, back to the example of physical activity in a local community. You can look at mortality rates. You can look at mortality rates for causes related to inactivity, like heart disease or colon cancer. You could look at heart disease rates among low education groups, because as you remember, the rates of physical activity were much, much lower among people with less education. You can rate, look at just rates of activity overall. And then if you wanted to work in primary care, you might look at whether people are being counseled to get more physical activity, because we know that when you get counseling from your primary care provider, no matter what the behavior is, um, rates go up. In other words, people will follow advice from others they respect like their primary care provider. So those are just a few examples of some of the outcomes you might begin to track. And so then the third part, and the last part we'll cover in, in any depth today, is this issue of trying to ask answerable questions. And um, those can come up in a whole bunch of different ways. They can be an epidemiologic question, like what's the rate of healthy eating in my local community? Um, they can be health equity questions. Uh, in other words, what are social determinants underlying this issue of healthy eating in a local community? Who's most at risk of, of, having, um, of, of having a healthy diet or a lack of a healthy diet in a local community? If the next slide, 
You might ask policy questions. How do we address this issue? What's a policy change that would address it? Um, is there a local zoning? Um, do we incentivize um, uh, for, uh, supermarkets that would have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables to be in all neighborhoods in a community? Or do we set up uh, community gardens? Or do we set up farmers markets to, to have better access? And can policy help to enable those? Policy, as you all know, is the biggest driver to affect health and health equity. And then what's working? That's an evaluation question. So next slide. And then we might ask managerial questions. What's working and what's not? And then a policy rated, what's really an evaluation question as well. Uh, what's the impact of changing a certain policy? So let's say your local community changes the zoning policy. Is there a value added to doing that? And, and tracking that over time can be very important. Okay, next slide. So I'm just gonna go over a couple of these and then leave a little bit of time at the end for some wrap up discussion of where we're going next. Give me just a couple examples here. So if we're trying to ask a high quality question that would lead toward local level evidence-based decision-making, think about which of these questions is more helpful for you. And we'll do this one in chat. Question A, how does the community conditions or environment, for example, some of these social determinants influence this particular health uh, condition of physical activity? Or do disparities exist? Which of those kind of getting to root causes, getting to social determinants would be a a better question for you to ask. You like A or B? You can put that in the chat. You know, this one is sort of a trick question. Because if you're just starting out, you might start with B, just to document. Yeah, exactly. Nicole, you nailed it. Um, that was exactly what I was thinking. Um, this isn't a clear cut thing because you probably would start with B to sort of let's document what's going on. Think about disparities as the measurement tool for health equity. And so example A is really health equity question. And that's really the underlying root causes of what's going on. But you'd probably start with question B. Okay, let's do one more, Renee. Um, a policy or intervention question. How do we get support for a new physical activity program? Or B, are there examples in the literature of effective physical activity policies or intervention that fit the needs and priorities of disadvantaged communities? In other words, communities experiencing inequities within each of your own communities. And, and I would say, B is a much more robust question. We want to know what support means. Um, does that mean support from policymakers, support from community members, support from the leaders within your agency? And so that would come into play as well. And then we'll just kind of skip through the rest, just give it a framing. This would be evaluation questions. These would be managerial questions. These would be, and you keep going, policy questions. Um, one is crisis oriented, one is more proactive about policy evaluation. In other words, how effective, in this case, a school health guideline that was put into place. Very important. We know that schools are super important in promoting health and youth. Very effective, challenging to do sometimes because of all the things that are happening in schools and, and trying to move health up on the priority scale. Next, next slide. And so um, I'm forgetting exactly where we're gonna cut off. And, Yeah, so a couple more slides, and then um, we'll sort of wrap up. Remember partner input, remember who your partners are, is very important when you're thinking about these questions. Uh, try to broaden the tent as much as you can. Different partners are gonna look at an issue from different ways. These can include people affected by the, by the condition, the general public, policymakers, people in your own agencies, and then how you gather. It's more quantitative, like a survey, or is it more qualitative by talking to people? Next slide. And then the last part we'll kind of move around to later, 
is what are the solutions, especially policy oriented solutions, active transportation, safe routes to school, uh, funding for a mass media campaign. So the policy issue there wouldn't be a mass media campaign itself. It probably would be the funding. In other words, the resources to be able to do that. Next slide. And so all this gets us to, in a way, this is sort of getting to the bottom line issues. Um, how do we begin to think about the health issue? This is the Yogi Berra, like what's our goal? What are some of the questions we wanna ask about that? Who are our partners? Beginning to think about resources. And then later we're gonna talk more about policies. And, and the two parts around policies are important is what the policy is and then how do you make it happen? And you all know a lot about what the policies are. I think the trickier part is the how. And so when we talk in later webinars, things like policy advocacy, who the right partners are, how do we message things? How do we reach different audiences who might not have a big impact or a vested interest in health? All of those things come into play. And then thinking of this last one, don't forget about negative impacts or sometimes other beneficial impacts. Um, one of the earliest things when we were starting to work with schools in rural Missouri around getting kids more physically active, uh, they were really concerned about academic achievement. The literature started coming out about if you do physical activity, you're not only getting health benefits, but achievement scores can go up. And so there was a side benefit from physical activity that, that people hadn't really been aware of that helped us move forward with some, some local policy change in schools. Okay, next slide. All right, um, and so kind of wrapping up, um, remember to use data, remember to involve those affected, uh, be as creative and non, you know, not making a final judgment when you're first starting out. Recognize we all come to the table with some bias, ask questions that are answerable, even if it can be difficult to get that answer. And remember, this isn't linear, that it's, it's circular, that it's very iterative. And so that's partly what we wanted to get across in this first session. And then I think the next slide. Um, yeah. The hand to you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ross. Um, you know, we know this is going to be an iterative process, uh, especially as you're pulling in um, other partners, stakeholders, um, and developing the statement. I think just a couple of things that I want to plant the seed about that we're going to further build out in future webinars is the importance of like what's happening with the public narrative um, and as you're developing this narrative and and framing and how framing will be really important. So we just wanted to call attention to several items that you should be thinking about if you if you're not already um, and really the importance of linking current data and messages to long-term trends. And we kind of talked about that in the beginning because a lot of these health disparities and health issues um, have happened over time. Um, and and it, that is really important to communicate. We wanna make sure that we're defining the issues so community influences is clear as well as opportunities. But um, understanding those influences, um, explaining the connection, um, and then interpret data for the reader, tell the public what is at stake, what does it mean to neglect this issue? And most people have a hard time understanding data or it takes some time to interpret it. So really put it in a way that is easily digestible. Uh, like, you know, one in five adults is not physically active is a, a good example of that. You also um, wanna focus on how well the community, the community, a collective is addressing this issue, not just individuals and not just special cases of individuals. So really talking about the collective. Um, and it is important to connect your community issues to conditions, to root causes and trends. And thinking about it in, um, with explanations or analogies that are really familiar. So you really just want to clearly make that connection between the conditions and the issue. And then, um, of course, you know, that really, that sets us up to really talk about 
solutions through policy um, and gets people to think more broadly instead of narrowly into maybe like programs or interventions and at the individual level. So we're going to talk more about um, policy solutions the next webinar, but really it's really important to present those policy solutions. All right, I wanted to share just a couple resources. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide. You will have these resources to help in guiding your issue statement. Um, and, you know, I wanna like pause. I mean, this we're at the point where, I mean, we're, we're okay on time, but I, I wanna like address any questions that may have come up so you can, you certainly can drop those in the Q&A or even the chat if that's um, comfortable for you, um, but definitely connect with us. So, um, you know, whether or not you drop a question in the Q&A or the chat right now, you can follow, with, follow up with us after the webinar. Um, so my contact information is there and I certainly connect, can connect you with Ross and other team members. 